Thank you so much for such a fantastic introduction. It is truly wonderful to be here this evening. Uh, so, I am going to be talking a little bit about fashion and dress in the time of Shakespeare and also looking at how Shakespeare's uh, dress, Shakespearean dress, it continues to influence contemporary design. Um, as you've heard, I'm a fashion historian uh, and that means that what I do is look at clothing from the past and think about what wider stories that can tell us about the society and the culture in which they were created. So that's what I'm going to be doing tonight, looking at Shakespeare. So what better place to start than with Shakespeare's words themselves? Uh, now, Shakespeare lived from 1564 to 1616. Across those years, he um, lived through the end of the reign of Elizabeth I and into the reign of uh, James I or James VI of Scotland. Uh, so we're looking at Elizabethan and Jacobean fashion and what that meant to people at the time. So here we have some absolutely fantastic quotes from Shakespeare. With silken coats and caps and golden rings, with ruffs and cuffs and farthingales and things, with scarves and fans and double change of bravery, with amber bracelets, beads and all this knavery, what hast thou dined? The tailor stays thy leisure to deck thy body with his ruffling treasure. Now, ruffling treasure, fantastic. You can really get a sense of, obviously, the poetry of Shakespeare here, but also a sense of the absolute luxury that was encapsulated in textiles and dress at this time. And that is really key to Elizabethan and Jacobean fashion. In the 21st century, we're used to fast fashion, we're used to walking into a shop, being able to buy anything we want to wear straight off the rack. This is an entirely different mindset to the way people were dressing in Shakespeare's day. Uh, clothing was very much associated with your status in society, your position. Textiles were one of the most expensive things that you could own. It's an absolute world away from our experience of dress for the most part in the 21st century. We get a real sense of the luxury um, and of the wealth and prestige that comes along with clothing in this quote. Now, in this time, uh, fashion was very much dictated by the monarchy, by the monarch themselves, and it trickled down through court, um, through the nobility, and then further down to the rest of society. So what we have is a very clear link between fashion and between the elite and wealth and status. And that is really a theme that we see recurring again and again and again throughout Shakespeare's plays and also within fashion of the time. Next, we have a quote from Hamlet. Costly thy habit as thy purse can buy, but not expe expressed in fancy, rich nor gaudy. For apparel oft proclaims the man. Now, this is possibly one of Shakespeare's best known quotes. Apparel oft proclaims the man. But in Shakespeare's day, this had a very, very definite resonance. There was this idea that clothing should dictate what was seen as the natural order of society. What you were wearing should be a very visual indicator of your wealth and your status. And this wasn't just an arbitrary decision. This was literally dictated through legislation. It was put onto the statute books what certain groups in society could and couldn't wear. These were known as sumptuary laws, and they basically forbade the lower classes from wearing anything that was too costly or too rich or too fancy. The idea being that you should be able to look at someone and understand immediately what their position in society was. So this, along with my opening quote, uh, really kind of gets to the core of what fashion meant during the time of Shakespeare. Now, it was also during Shakespeare's life that the theatre of retail that we've just heard conveyed so fantastically was really born. This is the Royal Exchange, and it was opened by Queen Elizabeth I in 1570. Now, before it was opened, merchants would do their business, financial transactions, etc., uh, on the muddy streets of the city of London. But when the Royal Exchange was opened, what you essentially get is uh, London's first department store. And so that theatre of retail that we're seeing right here at Selfridges really had its sort of birth, its beginnings uh, in Shakespeare's lifetime. 
However, not everybody was enamored of this idea of dress being associated with wealth and status. The Puritan uh, pamphleteer Philip Stubbs wrote a lot about fashion and dress at this time. And he believed that to have pride in one's appearance and pride in one's dress was the biggest sin of all. As you can see here, he believed beautiful garments are the devil's nets to entangle poor souls in. So we have this kind of dual uh, strain of thought running through um, Shakespeare's lifetime um, and the ideas of fashion and dress during this period. So, I wanted to move on to discuss women's clothing during this time. Uh, see where she comes, apparelled like the spring. Now, this is a classic Elizabethan late 16th century silhouette. What we have here is a woman wearing a bodice, which would be boned using whalebone, maybe reed, maybe wood, um, so stiffened. Uh, a bodice joined in the centre by the stomacher, which you can see kind of here, which gives this very elongated torso. Stomacher is not an item we ever really see reproduced in contemporary fashion. But this is what gives the uh, Elizabethan silhouette. And of course, we have the farthingale, which is what the skirts are supported on. This is a wheel or drum farthingale um, called for um, its shape, which resembles both a wheel and a um, drum, as you can see. Uh, now, this was created by a structure that was worn underneath the skirts, and it could also be created, uh, which you can see brilliantly in this print, um, by the use of what was called a bum roll. Um, now, you can see the bum roll being fastened here on the right-hand side. It was literally a padded section worn around the waist and tied that could also help to give that uh, very specific silhouette. So now we move on to start thinking about how this silhouette can be reproduced or has been reproduced in contemporary dress. This is a collection, um, a Dior collection by John Galliano. John Galliano has had a consistent interest in historical dress and also very much in the theatre of fashion as well, theatre of the catwalk. Uh, this collection, when it was shown, he actually used some of the soundtrack to Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet during the catwalk show. Um, and you can see here a sort of contemporary, very theatrical version of the farthingale being shown in Paris. Here we have slightly more wearable, slightly more contemporary versions of the farthingale. Simone Rocha, inspired directly by Shakespeare and by Elizabeth I um, in this collection that she showed. You can see a much more contemporary version of the farthingale here, and also inspiration in the trim that's being used as well. Uh, on the right, we have Vivian Westwood, another designer who is very, very well known for her interest in historical dress. Um, now, Westwood herself has claimed that she is in no way nationalistic, but she does believe that the only time Britain was great was during the time of Elizabeth I and Shakespeare. And that is reflected brilliantly in this collection from 1997, which was called Five Centuries Ago and drew heavily on Elizabethan dress. Uh, and this was actually the finale of that show, the catwalk show five centuries ago. You can actually find uh, a clip of this on YouTube. It's an incredible show to watch. Now, I absolutely love this because you can see the source material so, so, so strongly. This portrait of Elizabeth I, um, her gowns are embroidered with birds and beasts and flora and fauna. It's just incredible. You get a sense of her as this godlike monarch, you know, able to command, um, command all of the beasts of the world in a way. And it is reproduced beautifully by Vivian Westwood in this collection here. So, a contemporary of Shakespeare, the playwright Thomas Tomkiss wrote, a ship is sooner rigged <laughs> than a gentlewoman made ready in 1602. However, to suggest that it was only gentlewomen who took a long time to get ready during this period um, is, just, is frankly just not true. Here 
we get a sense of the way that men were dressing during this period. Um, this is an image of Richard Sackville, and you get a sense of the prevailing silhouette of menswear at this time. This was created by a doublet, which was the men's equivalent of the bodice that was worn on the top, um, and could equally be boned, could be stiffened. Then you get the trunk hose, which I'll come on to talk about shortly, which I'm trying to replicate here in my faux Shakespearean look that's gone a little bit pantomime. <laughs> Uh, and also, of course, the stockings, the garters, um, and these magnificent pom-poms on the shoes as well. So this is the kind of typical silhouette that we're looking at when we're thinking about a Shakespearean man. So here we have Robert Dudley, the Earl of Leicester, who was the only serious suitor of Elizabeth I, um, and her favorite as well throughout um, her lifetime. Here you can see him wearing a doublet, um, which is the red sleeves. He's wearing trunk hose as well, and he's wearing the jerkin over the top. So the jerkin was an outer layer, usually sleeveless, and often made of slightly more hard-wearing materials, something like leather, to conserve warmth, whereas the doublet could be silk, embroidered, um, again, very, very luxurious item. Now, this is the Dior collection again, where what you, what's interesting about this is you can see how menswear has also been used to inspire contemporary women's wear. You see this very clearly in the embellishment, the detail, and also in the silhouette. Again, more examples, this absolutely exquisite McQueen collection from autumn 2013. There are a number of details in this entire collection that you can trace back specifically to Tudor portraits, Jacobean portraits. It's absolutely beautiful. From the detailing on the mask to the silhouettes um, of the dresses, everything. Also, we have Gareth Pugh, another designer well known for his interest in historical dress. Now, what's fantastic about a designer like Gareth Pugh is that he doesn't simply recreate the past, but he really reinterprets it to a point where it often has, it often looks incredibly futuristic. People are often very surprised that he actually has historical inspiration because it looks so otherworldly and, um, you know, so kind of sci fi. So here is a great example of the jerkin. Um, we can see it again, usually leather worn over the top. Three minutes, oh, okay, I'm running out of time. Um, <laughs> uh, reproduced again by Alexander McQueen. What I love about this, Giles Deacon showed this collection in Banqueting Hall, uh, a 17th century building which has royal lineage. It's where Charles I was actually, actually executed. He was inspired by this uh, building when he was creating this collection. But what is great about this is the coat slinging that we see so much at Fashion Week these days. Actually dates back to the Tudor era. Okay, finally, the trunk hose we have. These were the subject of an edict in 1562, uh, which said that they had become monstrous and outrageous, and they needed to be made smaller. However, Robert Dudley, being the favorite of Elizabeth I, didn't seem to be getting into any trouble. Uh, you can see this recreated on more contemporary catwalks by designers such as Miu Miu. It's also a favorite of Dolce & Gabbana. Also here, reinterpreted as menswear, which we see very, of, very rarely in this collection that I adore by Bernard Wilhelm. Rushing through, stockings are an absolutely key element of menswear at this time. Um, and this is very clear from Shakespeare's writing. Uh, uh, Juliet's nurse says of Romeo, though his face may be better than any man's, his leg yet excels all men's. Uh, also, much ado about nothing. With a good leg and a good foot and enough money in his purse, such a man will win any woman in the world. The idea that you have these very shapely, long legs it is um, incredibly important. It's seen as if you're a courtier, you must have these incredible legs. It's a huge erogenous zone for men at this time. Now, this is something that, interestingly, we're really seeing coming back into contemporary fashion. See it here on the catwalk, but also we're beginning to see this on the high street as well. This is an article from The Guardian last year. 
uh, covered a number of hosiery sites and how many uh, men they have as customers. Uh, this is an advert for a men's hosiery company and Meggings. <laughs> how, how we love a portmanteau in the fashion world. Uh, Meggings, hugely popular. I teach at London College of Fashion. I see this look all the time in my male students. So this genuinely is something that is coming back into fashion. The ruff, of course, a key element uh, of uh, Shakespearean style. And we see this in contemporary catwalks all of the time. One minute left. Great. <laughs> because I've got loads to go through. <laughs> OK, so the uh, shirt, the item that's actually worn underneath all of these very fine fabrics, something that could be laundered, made of linen, it collects your sweat, you can take it off and wash it. This is also being used to inspire contemporary design. Couldn't really finish this without mentioning the cod piece. It's a little bit before Shakespeare's time, but, um, but is still something that's worth mentioning. This was actually the equivalent of a fly. It was used to hold together the trunk hose, um, but of course it could become stuffed. It became a real symbol of virility. Now, we don't really see this replicated in contemporary fashion, but... <laughs> But the only, the closest uh, option I could find was really this Rick Owen show from last autumn, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. In this, male genitalia was on display through quite a lot of the looks, which is something that genuinely is quite rare in a contemporary fashion. Okay, and so really this is where I wanted to finish off, just looking at the overriding influence um, of Shakespeare's, the, uh, Shakespeare's ideas of dress on contemporary fashion. This is Mark Rylance at the Globe in 1999, when the Globe reopened in the late 90s, uh, there was a big um, uh, move to really recreate theatre as it would have been seen in the time of Shakespeare. This had its uh, effect on the costumes and also on the drama itself. So here we see Mark Rylance playing Cleopatra. Of course, during Shakespeare's time, women were not allowed on the stage. So you had men playing women's parts. Gender play also is a huge um, factor within many of Shakespeare's plays. Now, this is something that we genuinely are seeing becoming an overriding influence in contemporary fashion. Of course, here in London, J.W. Anderson is really at the forefront of this movement, conflating men's collections, women's collections, the idea of breaking down this gender binary in dress. But we're also seeing it further afield as well. Uh, in this, these recent Gucci collections, we're seeing fabrics and surface decoration being matched in women's wear and also in men's wear. Um, also, Selfridges, of course, itself being at the forefront of this with the agenda store within a store that they had very recently. So with this Gucci collection is really where I wanted to finish off, with this matching of surface texture, decoration, the idea of embellishment and richness and luxury in fashion being worn by both men and by women, exactly as it would have been in the time of Shakespeare. Thank you very much. Sorry for overrunning. <laughs>